and refugee students and how they're faring uh, in COVID. And thank you very much for um, everybody in NELTA who invited me to make this talk. And also to my doctoral candidates, uh, Anna Garcia Ayen, Yasmin Hakuz, and Wenmin Liang, who, who helped me uh, gather background information on COVID that I didn't have. But also Anna taught me how to screen share yesterday. So digital things are new to everybody. Um, so I'll be looking at um, the background, for example, school closures, uh, successes and shortcomings uh, with moving on to online teaching. And now just this month in Canada, we're going back into the classroom in K-12. to uh, Some of the challenges, stressors, coping, what's it like for immigrant and refugee students, um, and then for international students in higher education, and some possible opportunities. Um, so uh, in March, um, schools were closed uh, to flatten the curve so that hospitals wouldn't be overwhelmed um, and all learning went online um, and in talking about learning um, really immigrant and refugee children aren't mentioned very much so I was very curious to see how they were faring over the last six months um, and in terms of health 44% of the cases in Ontario, the province where I live, were actually immigrants, refugees, and newcomers, uh, with refugees having the highest percentage. And so uh, is this because there weren't multilingual materials getting to them, um, talking about medical precautions, or was it related to they were frontline workers and maybe other people had jobs where they were working from home a bit more? Um, now in schools, um, people are going back into the classroom and there's a lot of confusion um, and there's sort of every sort of model. Um, there may be on, still online or it might be blended. They might go in for part of the week and they might still be online for part of the week or they might be in person all the time. And it might depend on the, some parents have choices of if they want to send their children. And then it depends on what the school is arranging also. Um, in terms of universities, we weren't so much affected. Um, if you see the bottom, 92% of courses carried on. Um, when things went online, there were two more weeks of teaching for me. And of my two courses, one already was completely online. So it wasn't very hard to put the other one online for the last weeks. Um, where some students have had difficulty was, for example, faculty of education, if they uh, we're supposed to do a teaching practicum in schools and schools were closed and, and things like that. But um, university students were able basically to keep learning and, and there were, there's the technology. Um, but in terms of learners and teachers in K-12, to it was much more challenging. Um, so my colleague Aisha Dakoto and her student uh, Mohamed Isteya have just completed a study on STEM teachers. And they did an online survey and questionnaire with teachers involving their attitudes, competency, curriculum, assessment, professional development, and support. And uh, she was very struck by the not promising uh, results. Um, over half of teachers didn't think the transition was smooth. They thought they had an unfair workload. 83% mentioned major challenges. Um, they didn't consider it a very positive experience for learners. They didn't feel they were getting a lot of support. They didn't uh, think the quality of digital resources was adequate and they weren't getting professional development. Um, in terms of um, pedagogy teaching strategies, um, they found it very, compared to if it was with children and it would be very focused on the students, they found this was just really focused on the content because they were having to somehow get the material out. And so they were uh, struggling to do that, so couldn't really focus on the learners like they would have done in a classroom. Um, in terms of assessment, it was mainly traditional. Um, and they felt it was basically ineffective. 
um, in terms of stresses that parents have been having, um, suddenly they became teachers, whether they were teachers or not, and whether they were still working, trying to leave the home and work and leave the kids at home and how could they teach them, um, or if they were trying to work at home and they were also supposed to teach their children. And then a lot of financial instability with so many jobs being lost and uh, recently, um, I saw that one in eight families don't have enough money to buy food, and that was only people that admitted that they didn't have enough money. So what is the actual percentage? And then when you're looking at this picture, um, what about newcomer children? And they have limited English, and their parents have, have limited English, and how are they faring? Um, one of uh, my graduate students has two very young children, and this was the daily schedule that she received. Um, but you can imagine if you're trying to complete a doctorate and you're also supposed to be doing this with young children. Um, so those are some of the stresses that parents have been having. Um, and uh, a colleague uh, who was trying to teach her university courses, her daughter was at home. And so this is the way she described it, that uh, she's in an elementary school and they got a nine to three schedule. It looked nice, but it depended on the capability if she was able to teach online and control children over Zoom. I mean, it can be challenging controlling children in the classroom. How do you control children over Zoom? Um, they had three half hour live lessons a day. Um, the homeroom teacher was very skilled, the other teachers less. And sometimes her daughter would put the, would leave the meeting or just put the camera down and lie down. Um, some sessions were pre-recorded and um, compared to what kids see on television, they found them very boring. Um, and the, the, content, um, the content was, um, complex and from the teacher's point of view it's very challenging to put the content online but the students weren't appreciating what it was like um, and so the daughter learned just to go back and copy the paper later um, and so she said as a parent it was a nightmare I had to be there so expecting a seven-year-old to type to use a mouse to download material um, seven-year-olds don't do that we do that but seven-year-olds don't do that um, and so she had to sit or the child would close the camera or leave the meeting. And she found it extremely difficult for working parents um, and perhaps would have been okay if the kids were older or if the parents were not working. Um, so the lack of interaction, lots of screen time, social isolation. Um, and so she said that it changed the home situation because she was having to nag her daughter um, who wouldn't listen and um, all at a time when my colleague was trying to concentrate on her own work and then assessment wasn't really real assessment either. So um, even if there are digital supports, um, they're challenging too. Um, and so uh, another uh, colleague, uh, this is what uh, schools were sending home to parents to guide them to use Google Classroom and, and that sort of thing. And the two bottom ones, free tutoring and STEM activities were provided by my university. But again, this all assumes that you're able to read English. And what about newcomers who don't and their parents don't and their parents weren't able to help them? So um, where were the multilingual materials? Um, and uh, another person reported again about how challenging it was for two parents working from home and um, that if students had had special education if they were autistic that all that was finished so that raised the question of what happened to ESL provision um, and so it would be a, a challenge for learners that did not have added support if English wasn't spoken in the home, if a family member wasn't able to help them with the English content, and if the learner was preliterate, if they were, you know, five, six, seven, they couldn't really read themselves, would they be able to participate in online learning at all? Um, and so there was a study conducted by Paradis quite recently in Vancouver and Edmonton where 25 to 35 percent of the children in uh, grades K to 12 kindergarten to the end of high school are ESL. In fact in Toronto 60 percent are ESL. So um, the issue of 
ESL children's needs uh, is very striking, but there just really isn't literature on how they're doing. And when you think of Bix and Kelp, um, and kelp can take seven years. Actually, this study found that even after seven years, if a 12 to 14 year olds had arrived later in Canada, uh, when they were five or something, that they were still having um, difficulty. And um, so again, significant ESL needs. And so the recommendations were to provide opportunities for continued development of language and literacy in the first and the second language. Uh, as Dr. Krashen recommended yesterday, extensive pleasure reading, um, develop oral language through text-based activities, but also continue to maintain and develop the home language and home culture, not just um, teaching English at the expense of the home language. Um, so uh, a recent survey of teachers about going back to school of 18,000 teachers interviewed 83% are very concerned um, for reasons such as this is such a scary disease as the doctor who spoke before me just described um, with serious consequences. So school safety, they're worried about themselves, they're worried about their students, their family members, mental health issues, burnout, um, the class structure, um, maybe schools are going to reclose in a month. Uh, we're reporting in Canada that just with the little bit that things have opened up lately, that now the, the uh, infection rate is as much as it was in July. So all the, um, the progress that was made, we've lost two months progress just by the little bit that things are more open now. So maybe things will be closed again soon. Um, and so supplies, I never had sanitizer until, you know, a couple weeks ago. Um, curriculum changing, how do you teach online? Uh, worried about students falling behind uncertainty. But the good news is that teachers are excited about going back to school and connecting with their students. Um, oop, this is just frozen. Okay. There we are. Okay, um, in the United States, um, uh, also for K-12 teachers, um, two times as many uh, teachers as compared to in February are talking about low morale. And in some cases, it's such low morale, 32% are talking about resigning. Um, there's also been a decline in student enrollment and the biggest um, level is preschool. So parents are thinking, well, they're younger, I can keep them home. But they also get literacy schools in preschool that help them with other grades. Um, and uh, teachers just don't feel that students have been making progress in online learning. So back to school, uh, a lot of the focus is on mental health. Um, and then from ideal to reality, um, ideally they wanted 15 student bubbles, you know, and a meter between desks and all that sort of thing. But in reality, there just aren't enough teachers. There's not enough money to hire three times as many teachers. So there's 50 student bubbles and they're very close and there's not social distancing. Um, and so this all comes, this sort of brings up, you know, how much resilience do people have to these stressors? So how quickly can you bounce back to things being crazy and upside down and and um, with regard to teachers there's a 3c theory of, of stressors so coping skills competencies context of work what's going on with practices and administrative support um, so um, in terms of uh, specific stressors um, for example, um, being in unfamiliar circumstances, having to carry on, do communicative language teaching uh, with or without digital devices and knowing online techniques and uh, technical and pedagogical skills. Um, and then the personal stressors about health concerns um, for oneself, for others, changes, and then threats to jobs. Are jobs going to be lost? How much um, can, how can this continue with the economy? What is going to happen? Um, and in terms of just regular stresses about being in English as a foreign language teacher, um, and so now also having to deal with overwhelmed parents, um, anxious, lonely learners. So there's a lot of stressors out there that teachers are dealing with right now. Um, and so from stress to coping strategies. Um, so the, the best suggestion is for active, approach-oriented um, coping strategies. 
Um, and so um, not just hiding, but sort of doing something active about it as much as possible. So gathering data um, about um, students and how to use technology, and identifying students who are having the most difficulty, maybe family problems, money, language issues, being sensitive and patient to them, even when teachers themselves are very stressed. Um, and also for teachers and also administrators to provide unthreatening um, situations where people can report mental challenges and somehow provide some sort of resources to them. Um, with regard specifically to refugee, immigrant, and international students, um, the, the refugee children um, are already dealing with pre-migration factors like war, violence, losses to health, infection, starvation, and then since arriving, discrimination, poor housing, language difficulties, now concerns about COVID, um, and so the lockdowns um, in terms for the international students at university, um, the closing um, facilities in the city and the university is causing emotional stress, um, loss of interpersonal context. They might be feeling very alienated and alone. Um, the government has provided some supports for university students, so they're processing study permits more quickly. Um, if a student uh, was home when uh, things were, or went after things locked down, they can study 100% of their program online from their home country. They don't have to physically be in Canada. Um, and they're also easing eligibility for work permits for people who are here now. Um, in terms of Syrian refugee uh, resettlement, so um, these are the students that we're working with. Um, 40,000 were resettled in 2015-2016, and they were designated prima facie, so they didn't have to prove refugee status. They were granted permanent residency immediately, which other uh, refugees aren't. They go through a, a period where their case has to be heard and they have to provide documentation. Um, and there's a lot of focus on refugee youths. Um, some of their additional uh, issues during COVID are they need more funding to purchase technology to be able to be doing the online learning which they can't if they don't have devices. Um, and then uh, learning digital literacy to be able to use the devices once they have them. And then uh, language issues, which might be a bar barrier to them understanding teaching. Um, it's frozen a bit again. Okay. Uh, we have a study, uh, Maureen Kendrick, Margaret Early, Saskia Still, and myself. And it's to uh, better understand and respond to the language and literacy learning needs of youth refugees in Canada, um, ranging from uh, elementary school to uh, college and university. Um, I've completed my phase one, which was uh, surveys with college instructors and interviews. Um, and we're in the middle of getting phase two approved, which will be student surveys and interviews with them about their own experiences and learning goals and about how they've been faring with COVID. And then we're going to turn to digital storytelling projects. And uh, we're hoping that they can learn transferable digital schools um, that may help them learn English because they're pleasurable and perhaps the skills will lead to more employment possibilities. And then the final stage will be some sort of digital exhibition of their projects. Um, so here's an example, not of something that my group has done, we aren't there yet, but there are many digital storytelling projects online, and I thought this one was appropriate because it was talking about Nepal. Um, and so this was in the form of a memoir, but there are many different things. Quick there are remind, uh, personal... Yeah. Quick reminder, we have one minute left. Thank you. Oh, okay. All right, so um, in terms of opportunities, um, they are getting more marketable skills. Uh, even the students at university who would have had a face-to-face -face English as an intensive English, pro intensive English program course, instead of, uh, you know, what they would have done right in assignment, now they're getting flipped classroom, voice thread, e-portfolio, turn it in, um, and also acquiring digital storytelling. Um, and in-person is preferable, but they are acquiring marketable skills. So 
um, in terms of coping strategies and finding solutions. Um, as the Hodges article that has been referred to a few times um, by the speakers suggests, uh, it requires thinking outside the box, creative problem solving, and hearing uh, what everybody's issues are. Thank you. Oh, so.